All right, guys, Brandon Lewis here at the Painters Academy, recording this for posterity. So when people are trying to make painting decisions in in the in the uh, year 2083, uh, they can look at some of this vintage material. And you know what? I don't think anything will have changed much. Uh, I've not seen much change in this business since I started. We're going to talk about a big, important topic today, and that's how to sell your painting business. And I think I may have shared with some of you that uh, I got my master's in business administration, and it was a complete waste of time, except for one class I took uh, with a, a gentleman who was an entrepreneurship uh, class, um, and he, he was very successful in business. And he says, before you start a business, you need to know how you're going to sell it, because if you can't sell your business, you don't have a business, you have a job. And if there's no equity, it, it's just a job, okay? You might as well work for somebody else. There's not a whole lot of point of it. Uh, now, granted, you can you drive higher income, but you can derive higher income being employed. So here's what we're going to talk about today, and we're going to cover a lot of ground. And so this is complicated, and a lot of people don't really want to hear something that takes work or that uh, requires a lot of energy or thinking real hard. But those are the people that are also always broke in this industry and you know you pull up to the paint store and it should be full of mercedes and bmws it really should because it's a very lucrative industry but instead it's full of old rusty trucks and vans and folks that are you know uh, had to be paid on friday so they can get their bills paid on monday that's the industry we live in the average uh, business is 1.7 people it's one dude and two-thirds of a helper that is it and so lest you think um that the industry is doing well it really isn't now a lot of people in the industry that run the business side do well but not necessarily people that are just in the painting industry or own a business and so we're going to talk about understanding why painters want to sell and if it even makes sense for you at this point we're going to talk about thinking like the purchaser of the business not yourself you will not purchase your own business therefore your opinion is honestly of little relevance unless you're going to sell it to yourself which would be self-defeating. Uh, the third thing is who typically buys a painting business um, for top dollar. It's usually not who you think it is. Valuing your business for sale, business systems review and implementation plan. Uh, the importance of peak income makes a big difference how much money you make those last few years. Setting a timetable for maximizing your sales price, finding the right selling device, marketing your business for sale, negotiating the sale, the in-between time, and identifying your next move. Half of you have probably already logged off because this sounds like work and it smells like work. So for those of you who this is like, oh God, I wanted him to give me a quick, I thought he was just going to sell it for me. I thought this was going to be one of these webinars where like somebody, got, can I just buy a product for $97 and it'll solve all my problems and I don't have to do any work? No, I'm sad. Uh, sad to report. If I knew what that was, I would be selling that instead of this, which is how to actually do it correct. So let's get right into it. Let's understand why you want to sell and if it even makes sense. So let's talk about some bad reasons with some bad outcomes. I get on the phone with people all the time because I've done about 2,500 hour long diagnostics. I've worked with 450 painting contractors in six different countries. And people get on the phone and like, I want to sell my business. And I go, why? And I go, well, I'm not making any money. My day-to-day -day life is stressful and chaotic. Uh, well, that kind of business can't be sold. Well, I hate my painters. I hate my customers. I'm like, well, who wants to buy that crap? Nobody. You can't sell that. You, know, you, go, you go kill time somewhere else. Um, those aren't good reasons because this type of business can't be sold, but it should motivate an owner, in my opinion, to fix his business for his own benefit. Um, and your old habits and mindset will follow you. That's one thing I tell these guys all the time. Well, the painting industry is terrible. You just can't make any money in this industry. And my market's terrible and you can't find any help and every other excuse under the sun. And I'm like, I've seen people make money in every conceivable market, rural, urban, six different countries, doesn't matter, doesn't make any difference. If, if your business isn't making any money, it ain't the market, it's not the painters, it's the you. You are the problem. It's almost always the owner. And so if, if the motives are wrong, nothing can be right. And you can't sell a business that's not working well for you to somebody else, not for any amount of money that you'd want to let it go for. So here are some good reasons, good reasons to sell your business. I'd like to retire one day. Well, that makes sense. I help a lot of people. I've, I've helped about two dozen people sell their painting businesses. I just had one sell just here recently, just about a week and a half ago. And uh, retirement, uh, 
people, when, when you go for retirement, uh, a good reason for fixing your painting business is you can have better income in your final years. You, you, if you fix your business and get it ready to sell, you can have a big, huge payout at the end that you can invest or do whatever you want to. A lot of people have a desire to relocate to a better state or country. Uh, I've worked with people uh, in other countries that wanted to sell their business and move here. I uh, recently uh, helped somebody who wanted to sell their business to get out of a state they didn't like. And, and almost all of it had to do with COVID restrictions. And they just, they, didn't, they don't want to live in a state or a country where their livelihood may be erroneously threatened uh, should some kind of goofy thing happen again and the government want to take away everybody's rights and freedoms. They're like, I'm tired of it here. I'm not doing business here anymore. I'm moving. Those are good reasons. And finally, to pursue a new business opportunity. I helped another uh, young gentleman sell a, a painting business here recently uh, who wanted to get back into uh, his love for the food industry and to carry out his family's legacy in the food industry. He was very successful in painting, but wanted to go back to what he thought his first love with. These are all good reasons. But my business sucks and isn't making any money is not a good reason to sell because you can't sell it. So let's talk about major benefits of getting your business ready to sell whether you want to sell it today or 15 or 20 years from now, number one, you will make money while you do it. My wife and I recently sold our house or not sold it, got it ready to sell. It's on the market. I've been in there for 15 years. I love my old house. And buddy, by the time we got the hardwood floors refinished and got the flooring replaced upstairs and painted everything and did a bunch of carpentry work and did a bunch of landscaping, I turned around and said, why in the hell didn't we do this 10 years ago? <laughs> we could have enjoyed it through a whole dumpster way of stuff. And that's how your business is, right? You're in it. And sometimes people will work real hard to get their business ready to sell. And guess what they decide? I've had this happen about 60% of the time. It starts making so much money, they don't want to sell it. And their day-to-day -day life gets manageable. And so that's really the whole reason to get your business ready to sell is for the present. Uh, but if you get it ready and you do want to sell it, you'll get more for it. And again, you may decide not to sell it at all. And that's a, a tremendous benefit. So this is something I teach our members all the time. If you want to understand what John, why John Smith buys what John Smith buys, you have to see the world through John Smith's eyes. Your opinions don't really matter much because you're not buying the business. So why do people buy a new business? we got to get clear on this before we think about selling it. And you need to think about it now, even if you're doing it later. Why do people sell a business? Well, think about the emotions and the dreams you had when you started your own business. I'm going to work for myself. I'm going to have freedom. I can spend more time with my family. I'm going to make more money. I'm not going to have a boss. I've got something with equity. I've got something that uh, can be a legacy. Uh, I can carry on a family tradition. Whatever your reasons are, it's all those emotional reasons are why people get into business. It's why you probably got into business to begin with. And people are looking for freedom, independence, self-reliance, self-image, money, equity, you know, income, whatever it is. So when you get ready to sell your business, you have to ask yourself, is, is this the reality of my business presently? Because if I'm going to get it ready to sell, it's got to be something somebody wants to buy. So who typically buys a painting business? Well, it's not who you think. <laughs> Most of the time, people are, I'm going to sell this to my estimator who has no money and who's in debt up to his eyeballs personally. I'm going to sell it to a family member who may or may not want it. And now I've got all these emotional entanglements with selling something to a son, daughter, brother, buy it from a father, whatever. I've seen that not work out far more often than I've seen it work out. I'm going to sell it in a, as, as an ESOP to my employees. I, I, you know, that always falls apart in most cases. But who typically buys a painting business is the same person that would buy a painting franchise and there are thousands of them out there, but they tend to have more capital. So they've got more money. So instead of having the 65,000 to 150,000 that it takes to get into a Serta Pro or a franchise or a five star, depending on the market, these are the kind of people that got four, 500,000, 600,000, 800,000, a million dollars, or they're going to give you half a million and then they're going to finance the rest of it through SBA and some other type of financing. These are not your employees. Your employees do not have this type of capital in most cases, or in almost all cases. And so these tend to be corporate America retirees, layoffs, um, refugees from corporate America who are just sick and tired of living in cube land and saying yes, sir, and no, sir, no matter what type of environment they work in. 
retired military. Occasionally, it is family, but again, it is it's a little bit rare, and it becomes um, it becomes um, complicated because you know emotions come into play and relationships come into play with family. Not to say that you can't do it and it doesn't ever get done. It does, but it, it's usually not as often as you think. So, who rarely buys a painting business? Employees, I've already mentioned, other construction companies. I'm going to sell my painting business to another painting business. Well, that painting business doesn't know how to run their business and they don't know how to sell their business. And what in the hell do you think they're going to buy yours for? They can't and they won't and they don't. Uh, family, most cases, not, not the people you'll sell your business to. Maybe you'll be an exception. So let's talk about valuing your business for sale. And at the end of this presentation, I'll talk to you about a tool that I've developed. And if you're an APPC member, uh, Anthony or or Brandon, everybody here is Brandon, uh, Maddie, uh, Brian, uh, you, you'll see the tools. It's very weird. I've never seen this particular error show up before. Um, <laughs> so when I brought, that tool's already been sent to you. But understanding um, your annual net benefit to owner. I got on the phone yesterday with a know-it-all, which is usually about 80% of the calls that I get on. Somebody that knows it all but didn't make any money, and he hired somebody to try to sell his business, ABC Marketing or some bull crap. He couldn't tell me how much he made, really. I've got this marketing company to try to sell his business. I'm like, I've never heard of that before. I don't sell businesses, by the way. I just make that up front. I get it prepared. I help walk you through the process. I get it profitable. I get it ready to market. I get it ready to be appealing um, to another owner to help you get your business systems in place to reduce your day-to-day -day stress. But I'm not a business broker. And uh, and I asked him, how much you make? He couldn't tell me. And it like this went on for four or five minutes. And then he gave me a couple of different numbers that I, I had no faith in as being accurate. So you, you can't do that. Like if you don't know your numbers, it's going to be real difficult for you to sell your business. So let's talk about what net benefit is to owner. Uh, it's kind of what I call in my program, cash flow uh, or, or benefit, net benefit to owner. And that benefit is your net income. Okay, that's what, what you make. Some people put that in a different pile. I don't understand why. Your salary. Anything that would be considered a benefit if employed. So if you worked for your company and you were not the owner, if you were just the general manager, the fact that you bought an $80,000 pickup truck when you really needed an $18,000 pickup truck to run your business, the fact that you've you know, got your wife on a gym membership with personal training or that you stay in hotels when you go visit your family and write it off as a company expense. The fact that somebody gave you $25,000 cash for painting in their house in a brown paper sack and you didn't report it. Those are all the types of things that really are just their benefits to you, right? If you added it all up as a compensation package, that's what you would have made. And that's what people are going to look at. And, and typically uh, people will get two to three times, and I'll show you um, the calculation sheet that I have, people tend to get two to three times uh, the multipl uh, multiplier of their income. So if you made $300,000, you can look on the income portion to probably sell your painting business somewhere between $900,000 and $600,000 plus the next slide, other value considerations. And that's your, your assets. And your assets are typically not much. There's not a whole lot of property, plant, and equipment in a business. You've got some used vehicles. You've got some used paint sprayers, some ladders, some pressure washers, maybe, maybe a copier, some desks, a TV, some file cabinets. That's about all a painting business is. There's not, this is not a factory. This is not a restaurant. And if you did buy a building like I did, uh, and I'm about to buy another one, um, that's really almost like your individual real estate. The real estate money and the income from that, if you rent out a portion of it, which I highly recommend, uh, typically ends up being just you know, passive rental income because you don't want to tie that in with your income because of the tax implications of your business. And so typically, let's say you got 80, you, you made, for example, six hundred thousand or uh, $500,000 in your painting business. You go to sell it, you'll probably get between a million and 1.5 and then you add your property, plant, and equipment. Let's say it's hundred thousand dollars. Will you just tack on hundred grand? They're not going to pay a multiple for fixed assets. Does that make sense? You're not going to pay more than something's worth uh, when you buy something. So the, another thing that you you got to immediately do if your if your business isn't making money, and 
and if your day-to-day life is stressful, it's it's always business systems related. And so when you have missing and broken business systems, that just means that your income's lower and your profitability is lower, which means you you can't sell your business for much. Um, and so you got to look at the total uh, income number, the net benefit to owner. Uh, you got to look at this, you know, business implementation plan. And, you know, I'm going to do something that I didn't mean to. Well, let me spend some time on this slide. I put this in the, the module for members, but I, I, I didn't include it as a slide. So I came up with 20 business systems that are pretty much essential to sell your business, right? And the reason you have to have these business systems in place is because when you look to, to buy a painting business, the first thing they're going to be is overwhelmed with the new job they're going to get as the owner, right? How do I estimate the price of a painting project when I've never painted? And I've certainly never quoted it to make money on it. So you, if you don't have production rate estimating, you can't teach somebody to cock their head sideways and guess. You can't teach that. That's an unteachable thing. You can't teach another owner how to guess. And guessing doesn't work anyway, by the way. Uh, I've never seen it work. I've, I, I get the job. When people join my program, I immediately have them, in most cases, not all, do job costing. And they start doing job costing because they hadn't done it previously, and they start turning in their numbers to me, and it's like the variance is 20 to 30% on every project. I'm like, oh, that's the guessing that you were so good at for 20 years, and now that we start measuring, we find out that your guesses suck. And that's what I mean by people thinking they know everything. Like I, when they start running the numbers, like it does not match up with reality, but people would rather be blissfully ignorant and poor than to have a little conflict in their life and make a lot of money. That's just human condition, right? And so they need to know how to do that. They need to know how to persuasively sell. That's just another system. I'll just rattle them all off for you here. They need to be able to reactivate their clients with a campaign. Then they need to be able to use some kind of retention newsletter to dot dry referrals. There's four. They've got to uh, be able to have, in most cases, they need to have some kind of bonus program for their men. They need to know how to conduct a, a crew meeting. They need to know uh, how to recruit painters, they, which is just generating leads for painters. They need to know how to assess their technical and non-technical skills. They need to have a uh, hiring and onboarding process. They need to be able to put them through some kind of safety training. Just got off the phone with somebody uh, uh, recently who had a big workers' comp claim and asked them, well, did you ever do any ladder safety training? Did you do, do you have a safety program, a safety manual, safety order? No, no, no. Well, if you get dragged off to court, your butt's in a sling. They need to know how to, um, uh, what else are other systems that are in there? They need to know how to schedule. Okay, schedule projects and manage projects from the office. They need to know how to uh, manage projects from the field standpoint. Okay, there's there are other ones. There's probably about seven or eight other ones that I included on that list. And when I started looking at it, I was like, man, I, I only thought there were about 12 essential ones. There's about 20. They're not hard. They're very difficult. They're very not difficult. They're very simple. They're very uh, rudimentary. They're not very difficult. But look, if you went to buy a painting business or say, say for example, you went to buy a restaurant. And you ask, well, what's the recipe for your number one selling food item? And so oh, I don't have one. I just kind of, it's in my head and I just kind of do whatever. You, you'd be like, I can't buy this business. Well, how do you get people in the door? Well, I, don't, I just kind of do it. And I, we, just, we got a good reputation. Well, no. I mean, when you tell people, hey, I got a list of 1,300 people that have bought from me previously. And if you just communicate with these people in this manner, you can count on at least $1.3 million in revenue from repeat and 600,000 from referral and you don't have to find another client. Well, that's a huge selling point. But if you don't contact your clients, don't have them in a list, there's no equity. Why well, somebody want to buy something that risky? They don't want to. If you work in new construction, you can't sell that crap for nothing. So you can hang that up. New construction is a dead end street. There's no equity in it. Um, and it, it doesn't make much money. Usually when I get on the phone with people either. So let's talk about the importance of peak income. When you get ready to sell your painting business, for every extra $1 you earn in your last two to three years, you get back two to three dollars at closing. Let me say that again. For every extra $1 you earn, you get, uh, it, when you sell your business, you get back two to three dollars in closing when you sell your business. So if you screw around and you're lazy about getting your business ready to sell, and you try to sell it, and now you got to sell it for five hundred thousand instead of a million, or instead of one point five million, you're going to feel kind of foolish for being lazy for the last two years, 
maybe the last 10% of your ownership, and you're going to sacrifice a tremendous amount of income. So you got to really push it those last two to three years so that you can get the multiple back. If you don't, I mean, it's like some of these retirement plans that are in government, uh, you know, these, they, whatever, they get some kind of multiple of whatever they made their last two or three years on average. And so that's why people work really hard to get high income there at the end, because, you know, people understand incentives. So setting timetables for setting the maximum sell price. This is something else that's important. The earlier you start, the better. Three years is optimal. Most people don't come to me for whatever reason on a three-year timeline. I have a hard time getting painters to think about the next 30 days sometimes, maybe a year out, maybe six months out, three years out. Oh, that's too much to think about, but it really is best. It really would be best. Uh, short, shortest fuse possible for, for ROIs a year. Now, you can get your business ready to sell and really almost implement every business system you'd need to in about a year's time. You can do it. The issue is, had you hung in there the year after you got it all fixed, your income probably would have doubled or tripled. Before I move on from this slide, let me just put tell you something that's on my mind here. I talked to a fellow yesterday. This is very typical of the calls I have. Had a client list, didn't know how many clients he had, hadn't ever contacted them, didn't have a sales process, didn't use production rates, doesn't use job costing, uh, running a business roughly about $600,000, made uh, $125,000. I did the, the hours between him and his wife and with the hours they put in and they made $36 an hour each. They would have made more money if they just painted for $50 an hour and they got like seven or eight employees. People just don't understand the math of a painting business. Like they don't ever do simple math. And you know, look at it. I'm like, gosh, all you got to do is like, job costing, production, or a few things like this guy, they're what I call doublers and triplers. And those are the people that are doing the bare minimum in every aspect of their business. Like they answer the phone, they recruit some painters, they paint some jobs, they, they email a PDF estimate, but that's about the whole sum of the business. It's like, what's the minimum I can do to process a job and move on to the next one? It is easy to double or triple your income, even with four or five systems, if they're the right systems, year over year, meaning like like meaning the next three months, if you look like right now, it's August, you start working August, September. There's no reason in November, if you made you know ten thousand dollars last year that you can't make twenty this year. It's not like you have to to wait forever to make more money in this business. It's because you you've only got so much work in the pipeline. Now, if you've done something crazy like sell a bunch of underbid work and you got, you're backed up six months because you're the cheapest guy in town, but you just don't know it, well, you can get out of that too by just telling people, I'm sorry, I can't do it, and just selling profitable work, but you do have to make a bunch of people mad or tell them you got to raise your prices or set some sort of limit on your work. I've seen people get into that situation. But aside from that, which is sort of rare, you can make more money like quickly. It's not, this is not one of those things where you, oh, if you work real hard for 18 months, you, you can see some improvement. It doesn't work like that. And unless you're just doing goofy stuff that really doesn't impact the bottom line. So to me, if you're not going to work to get your business ready to sell, you're just throwing your life's work in the toilet. I don't like failing at things and I don't like uh, being third, fourth, fifth best. I mean, if I'm going to spend 40 hours, 60 hours a week doing something, I'm going to do it well. And people are going to say, damn, he does a good job. And you should feel the same way about your business, in my opinion. And so almost everything that makes you more money in life, everything takes time and effort. And usually there's some anxiety producing things to do that cause you to want to procrastinate and make excuses. That's life, right? You know, learn to play an instrument, get along with your spouse, get yourself in physical shape, Build, buy, sell a house. It's all work, right? But it's all worth it. So that's the issue. So finding the right selling device. This is the thing you got to do after you've got your business ready to sell. Business broker. It is a necessary gamble. Now, hiring a business broker is always a gamble. You can get a good one. You can get a bad one. Okay? That's how it works. You might be able to get a franchise broker to sell your company as well. That's who sold mine. I had a relationship with a franchise broker. Uh, that I knew because I did a lot of uh, talk radio work. 
And uh, he and I got to know each other. And then I got ready to sell my business. And instead of having to pay him a percentage, I just gave him a flat fee to bring me buyers and I would vet them. And I knew how to put together a business prospectus because I had been to school and I could read books and follow directions. I, I put together a really a, basically just a very long sales letter, which is what a business prospectus is. I can put together financials. I can screen and vet people. I can pull credit scores. I can have people send me source documents on income. I have a good attorney. I didn't need somebody to walk me through the rest of that. Now, most business brokers aren't going to go for that. They're going to charge X percentage and you're going to have to do it for the most part their way. And so it's really important uh, to screen your brokers with qualification questions. And I've got some of these in this tool uh, kit that I'm going to talk to you about at the end of this uh, presentation. Uh, about how they're going to market your business, how they find and locate buyers, how they screen people, what their processes are, what's their deliverability, what are they going to produce in a portfolio or documentation? Uh, how are they going to negotiate a proper contract? What kind of legal counsel do they have access to? Because you may or may not have a good contract lawyer. And when you when you do get, and I may be covering this on another slide, you need to find somebody when you get ready to sell your business you need to find somebody that has a lot of experience in contract law and someone in particular who has been successful and has been engaged in the buying and selling of businesses dozens and dozens of times. You don't want, you know, Jack Leg Jimmy, your cousin, who's a divorce attorney to look over your, uh, you know, I go to church with this guy. This guy lives down the road. Well, you might as well you might as well just show it to one of your painters. I mean, it's not quite that bad, but like it it's 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 a specialized skill. And so you want somebody who is familiar with contract law in your state that has been in and around business transactions. Next slide. Don't forget the emotional appeal. When people look at businesses, they have some emotional feeling. They envision what it would be like owning, telling their friends that they own, being identified as the owner of X business, the freedom benefits it gives them, and then they go find some way to justify it through research. Now, if they go to justify it through research and they find that your company is not fit to purchase, they're going to move along. But if, if they have an emotional fit first, which is what everybody does before they make a purchase, they go, you know, have the emotional fit and then they stop for a minute and say, well, okay, I've had this emotional fit. Now I've got to at least, you know, do my logical due diligence, right brain, left brain. Uh, the bank is not the buyer. And one issue I have found and I take issue is it, business brokers tend to be, because they're focused on commission, in many cases, they are, they're kind of worried more about the, the deal falling apart with the bank. And they're worried more about the deal falling apart with the buyer because of financial reasons or because the bank doesn't like the financial documents. So they tend to be, in my opinion, a little too heavy handed on the paper shuffling. And they don't always sell or market as well as they should. And that they tend to be weak in that department. That's just been my experience. I've helped about two dozen people sell and I've just seen this. I saw this in my own uh, sell of my business. And I've seen it and I've helped other people sell their businesses that are not in the painting industry. And so I would kick in extra money for marketing promotion. If you can tell your, ask your broker, and this is one of the screening questions in the toolkit. Um, well, what is it, you know, what, where are you going to market my business? How are you going to generate leads? How much money are you going to spend? What's the budget, et cetera. And if they've got next to no budget, I just kick it in myself at my own expense because the more buyers you have looking at your business that are interested, the more people that are putting uh, offers to buy your business together, the faster you'll sell it. And for the more money, it's just, you know, if you have an auction and you got two people in the room, well, the price is going to go up to X. You get 200 people in the room. Well, the price is almost always going to go higher because there's somebody with a different financial situation in the audience and there's somebody with a, a different level of desire. So you've got to think about these things. After the, the list is posted, listing is posted because you will have business listings similar to how you list a home. Um, you may find a buyer fast like I did. Um, I found a buyer pretty darn fast. And I was surprised at how quickly the transaction uh, went by. That, that has not been the case with everybody I've helped. The, the company I most recently helped somebody sell, it was pretty darn fast. It wasn't as fast as they wanted it. 
but from my perspective, it was pretty darn fast. They had one little deal fall apart, and then they had another guy that bought it, the second person that looked at it. Um, it did take a long time to get through the due diligence and the paperwork, but I mean that that's going to happen anyway. That you're going that's going to that same time is just about going to be allocated for any buyer. So there will be a ton of info gathering and paper shuffling, and you will get frustrated because you think this thing's going to sell. Why can't they just buy? It? Why are they asking all these questions? It's because it's a big transaction. It's because it's a big transaction. It's a risky transaction, and typically a, there's a third party or a couple of third parties. There may be an SBA component and a traditional lending component and a uh, owner finance component, and this this crap just takes a while to to get through the process. So don't be frustrated. And just be be expecting it. Next one, negotiating the sale. So what's your major objective? As you go into the sale, you kind of need to think about this in advance. Do you want to sell it quick? Well, if you sell it quick, you're going to sell it cheaper, right? The faster you want to sell something, the easiest way to sell something fast, to sell it cheap, right? Or you want to maximize the value of the sale over time. That typically means if you're going to maximize the value of something in a transaction, that usually means that you as the individual are going to take on higher risk. Does that make sense? You're going to take on higher risk. Um, and there's a whole lot of you will make more money getting getting paid. You want low risk, which means you want the money up front and a lump sum. Now, when you take the money up front as a lump sum, you also got the other issue, which is called tax considerations. Especially if you get screwed, which depending on the timing of your business, you well could. When you have a banner year as you're getting your painting company ready to sell, and then somebody buys that SOB in December. And now you've had a banner income year and you get a lump sum from your painting business and that pushes you into an astronomical tax bracket. Not that the federal government wastes any of our money or misallocates it or spends it in foolish ways or loses it or gives it to people that don't even live here or dead folks, not to say that any of that would happen with your money, but they will take a large portion of your money to do that kind of stuff with. And so when you sell your business, you've got to get with a tax accountant and ask yourself, how do I keep the federal government from wasting my life savings? They've already taxed me on it the first time and they've taxed me this whole time, but they're going to tax you again because they love you and it's in your best interest. And so you've got to ask yourself these questions. Um, and then it's speed of departure. You know, I had a guy help sell his business and he couldn't get out of town fast enough. He wanted to get out of there. He was mentally out of that state two years ago, tired of it. And uh, but guess what you got? Training obligations. And those training obligations are going to be greater depending on you know, and different owners are going to want more or less training. You, you should count on at least a month. You might be looking at eight weeks. Um, of training the owner who buys your company. I mean, it, so if, you've, if you're self-financing a lot of it, you really want to make sure the training is good. You really want to make sure the training is good because if they don't succeed, you're going you're gonna to have to take it back and you're going to have to run it uh, or they may run it in the ground. Now, if you get a big lump sum, you can do good training or not good training, won't make any difference. You've made all the money you're going to make, but out of a sense of obligation and fairness, you, you really want to try to help this person succeed as much as you can. So the training needs to be good. So you owe it to your staff. You owe it, especially your staff and your clients, to train well, two weeks to two months. Um, you know, I mean, I've seen it vary as big as two weeks and two months. Some people have experience doing similar things, and they think they don't need any help, and they'll just kind of brush you aside. Uh, that's what happened to the guy that that ran that bought my business, who subsequently ran it into the ground and ruined its reputation with all of my clients and doesn't have any of the staff that we had. That happens too. So if you've got some kind of emotional connection to your business as if it were a child, that baby ain't yours once you sell it. And I've just found that the less you know about it, the better. And that's that's the way I feel about it. I don't ever ask, inquire, look at worry about my old company because I'm not running it anymore. It's just a name now. And so you got to think about that. Um, there's a bunch of stuff I've not covered here that I cover in, in some of the training stuff, but I think that's a good enough overview for, for most of you. So what's your next move? If you're going to sell your painting business, are you going to open up a painting business in a new market? 
two of the people that I'm uh, have just recently helped or am helping sell their business now or get it ready to sell, that's what they're going to do. They're going to sell their painting business in their current market. They're primarily just wanting to leave. They want to they leave Canada and Michigan, and I don't blame them. Uh, they want a different service business. I just want to do something different. I'll end the service business, do something different in the same locale. I love where I live. I just want to do something different. Uh, different business entirely, and then some people just want to retire. They're just older. They're in their 60s, 70s, and they're just ready to retire. Uh, I think it was two years ago at the Painting Profit Summit, we recognized uh, two people who I helped sell their business. One of them was in his 20s and had only been doing it for about four years, maybe three. Still got a good income from it. He was a very, very gifted young man. And another gentleman who was in his 70s who had been doing it for 30 something years. And so I see it all over the place. I mean, typically it, it's folks that are older, 50 to 70, but sometimes it's younger people. So, you know, the, in summary, every true entrepreneur should be selling their business or should be preparing rather to sell their business from day one. That's the whole point. You should be like the day you start your business, you should be preparing to sell it today. It, it's not a uh, it's like physical fitness. Uh, physical fitness is not about a diet. It's not about some kind of lose weight fast plan. It's about a lifestyle. So like, I'm not going to eat this. I'm going to get this much exercise and I'm going to do this from now until I drop dead. Why? Because I don't want to be overweight and in poor health. It is a lifestyle choice. Getting your business ready to go is a business lifestyle choice. And the, the beauty is you get it, you get it ready, you get the benefits forever. And so you're going to work the same amount of time, 40, 60 hours a week. You can do it in mediocrity or you can do it in excellence. Makes no difference to me, but make a big difference to you. And that's why you need to do it. And so it's a process that can't be rushed at, at a certain point. I uh, used to train people on how to raise money for political office. I used to work on finance teams for United States senators and congressmen, et cetera. That's, that's where I really got my, my uh, negative view of the government uh, from being around it and in it uh, and seeing that they often do not have our interest at heart. Imagine, imagine a sinful, corrupt human soul not having everybody else's best interest at heart. We've never, we've never heard, seen, or been made aware of that, but it does happen. And I used to try to teach them to raise money. And invariably, everybody wants to wait to do that at the last minute, but you can't do it at the last minute. It can't be rushed. Relationships can't be rushed, which is primarily what fundraising rests upon. There is a process and it is somewhat prolonged. So if you start it late, you just won't do well. And it's the same, it's the same thing with getting your painting business ready for sale. If you want to do it in three months, can you sell it in three months? Yeah. Will you get much for it? No. So you got to start early. It can't be helped. So I'll close with three very simple questions here today. Um, number one, are you making the kind of money you deserve for the time you've put in? It's a yes or no question. You know, when you go to the bank, you don't deposit your feelings and your emotions. The teller doesn't go, how are you feeling today, honey? I put a couple extra zeros on that for you. You don't look like your business is doing too well, but you feel like it's doing well. Here's some money. Like it does not work like that. Like they just look at the numbers and the numbers are the numbers. You know what the numbers are, or you should know. And if you don't know, that's usually a sign that it's not going well. And then the second thing, you know, is your day-to-day -day life manageable, predictable? And this is an important one compatible with your family life is it is it helter skelter crazy you never know what's going on want to pull your hair out you got people working for you that don't know what they're doing or maybe you're not teaching them how to do it it's it's not what you envisioned and then finally could you take your business to market now and get a return on investment that you would be happy with if the answer is no things are not going well and be like cars that are beat up worn out and need a lot of work, don't sell for much money, and neither do businesses. It is the same as selling a tangible physical object in many ways, and you probably know if it's in good shape or not. And so if you answered no to one or more of those questions, I got an offer for you. Number one, I'm, email me, brandon at paintersacademy.com, and just put in the subject line, let's talk. We'll get on a 60-minute diagnostic call. Now, I'm not going to promise you. You will like everything I have to tell you, but I will not be rude or mean about it. I'm just going to ask a whole bunch of questions about your operations, your sales, your retention, your reactivation, your time management, your paint pricing, 
systems, how you do inventory, how you train and monitor, measure projects. It, it's it's pretty intense. Uh, Forty five minutes of me asking a bunch of questions, it's like the Spanish Inquisition. I'm not going to lie because we got to cover a, a long period. We got to cover a lot of systems in a short period of time, and I don't joke around or chit chat or you know. Um, I'm not a counselor. I fix business problems and I'm very good at it and I will help you fix yours. But if you don't want to fix it, I don't it'll make any difference to me. I won't be mad at you. I'll just say, well, good luck. <laughs> I just let people go on their way. Step one, once we've had that call for free, I will give you something I recently put together for our APPC members. Uh, one thing that it, that has in there is a very, a very handy uh, spreadsheet. It's called a net benefit to owner and sales price calculator. So if you want to know what your painting business is worth right now, you don't have to guess. You plug the numbers into this puppy right here, and it'll give you a range with your assets and your income and everything else. This is the same document. Honestly, if you replace this, the title of this to business sales per perspective for John Smith, this thing, this is the same document you'd put under the nose of a buyer. It's just, it's the same damn document. I mean, it really is. And so it's the same document. This is what you, how you would value your business. And inside it, there's a worksheet and there is a, uh, there's a worksheet and it walks you through all the steps of selling a painting business. Some things I've not covered here because when I've, I've created these slides and then I've created this and I didn't go back and edit the slides because I was lazy about it, to be honest, I should have. Uh, but it has everything in here. It has all the business systems that are the bare minimum that you need to at least have fixed and ready to present to an owner in a uh, folder or a binder when they get ready to buy your business. Uh, it's got all the questions that you should ask of um, a broker, and it's even got how you should transition with your people. What do I do? How do I make an announcement? What you know when I get ready to transition this to the new owner? Our guys are going to be kind of upset. I mean, how are they going to take it? How do we make sure they retain the clients? And the and the uh, employees has air, all that kind of stuff in it that you'd never think about unless you had done something like this over and over again, like I have. Uh, when you do something repetitively and over and over again in a very niche specific thing, you just get good at it, whether you're good in general or not, which is kind of how I've got to be good at doing this is just repetition. So the only thing you stand to lose is 60 minutes and maybe a few bad habits. You probably got some bad habits. You'll discover them on this call and then we'll have to work on them. That's just how it is. But you can increase your income. You can have a lot more stability. And, and to me, a, a greater sense of pride and self-worth as a business owner. You can be like, yeah, I own that. And it's doing damn well. Not, yeah, I own this and it's stressful and it doesn't make any money. That's there's Nobody wants to own a business like that. So that it's up to you. You know, it's up to you. So you know my email address. So with all that having been said, uh, if you want a free 60-minute diagnostic call, this is, you know, the same call, Anthony Moon and all the other Brandon Lewis's went through. Uh, so weird. I've never seen everybody's name show up as my name. I don't know what happened or how, but it, it is it is so. So um, I'm going to take questions now. And we're going to do this in a very formal and structured way. And that is where you turn on your camera and you wave your hand in front of the camera. And when you wave your hand in front of the camera, um, I will unmute you and you can ask whatever you want to. The only reason I mute these things as we do it is because invariably people come on and they don't have their line muted and they're, you know, wrestling their cat and yelling at their kids and painting and everything else. And it's just noisy. And I can't talk when there's a bunch of noise in the background. So if you have questions, uh, ask them now or forever hold your peace, just wave it, wave your hands in front of the camera and I'll come to you. Anybody have questions or is everybody just depressed now? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to depress everybody. This is a lot of work. It's a lot of work, but it's got to get done. You know, painting a big house is a lot of work, but looking at it and, and crying doesn't put a, the first drop of paint on it. <laughs> What'd you do today, Jim? Well, I just cried in front of this big house all day. Did anything happen? Nope. Uh, it's just, you know, you got to paint it. I'll come to Anthony here. I think I have to ask you to unmute. Okay. There you go, all Anthony. Right. So you mentioned the uh, 20 business systems, and is that in the um members area somewhere for the list of it that? is it just went out uh as the as a mastery calendar email and it actually may have went out yesterday or the day before so for some reason you don't get that and i'll tell you one thing anthony that we get with you 
we get a hard bounce on your email in the system. It shows a hard bounce sometimes. You're still getting all our emails, aren't you? Um, I don't think so. We're past the, the five month thing. So I haven't received anything. I don't think. Well, you need, to, you need to email Jennifer. And if we have to, we need to change you over to something that is not your domain. And I have no, I have no earthly idea why it, it, it shows you as a hard bounce. We've reset your email like over and over again. Okay. It's Thank you. And one, of, it's you and Excel and, and uh, the gentleman that owns Excel painting services always show up and we keep resetting your emails. His says it's a hard bounce, but he says he gets it. And you say it's a hard bounce and you don't, but it's in the mastery calendar. So if you log in, to the members only portal and you go to the uh, mastery calendar tab, it's sitting right there at the very top. Okay. So email Jennifer. If you have another email address, I think we just plug it in, even if it's a personal one. Okay. I'll do that right now then. Thank you. Excellent. Glad you're here, buddy. Other questions. I'm going to come to Brandon Lewis. You just have to tell me your real name. I'm sorry. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Hey, Brian, it's Mike Sheetle. Um, hey, buddy. So I, I was the $35 an hour painter, so I felt a little hit. But ah. we've, done better th we've done better this year. Um, so my question is, for the size businesses that, I guess, are most appealing, assuming that all your systems are in place, you're profitable, um, you know, you check off all the boxes, as a, you know, a company that's doing, you know, a guy that's making, you know, say he's selling a million dollars, making 300,000 versus a $3 million company that's, you know, making, you know, $900,000 a year. Are one of the, do you get to a point where it's like, I have a harder time finding a buyer at a certain level? Uh, maybe. When I don't know the answer to something exactly, I don't do what most people do, which is to lie about it and pretend like I really know it, so I won't do that here. Um, i just tell you what I do know. Uh, my guess is the bigger your business is, the longer it takes to sell. Like any transaction, you think about a, a business put on the, or a home put on the market that's in Chattanooga, Tennessee, 300 to 400,000. That's going to sell a lot faster than a million dollar home because you got fewer people that have the capital to buy or the income to buy a million dollar home. So my, my guess would be Larger companies sell slower because fewer people have the capital that they need. However, I just had a friend of mine sell about a $14, $15 million home improvement business. So I know, and I've seen those types of businesses sell over and over again, but I would assume that they take a lot longer to sell because, you know, there are different people that have different levels of income. Fair enough. Thank you. So the biggest, the biggest one I've ever helped sell so far was really about one and a half million dollars, which is pretty small. You know, our average, um, our average member that attends Summit is around one point four to one point six million dollars. So if you, you know, the Painting Profit Summit, when you come there, half the people are one point five or bigger, and half the people are one point five or smaller, and so. Uh, 1.5 is about the size of the business. The, well, I think, man, what? No. I, if I count some of the people in gold, I guess I have sold some that are in the two and three. I just forget when you work with so many companies after a while, um, it all just runs together. But yeah, I think the bigger they are, the harder they are to sell. But that's why you got to start earlier and you got to be patient. Other questions? Any other questions? I'm going to mute you only because of the road noise. Anybody else have any questions? Just wave at the camera. If I can't see you, I can't answer your questions. Wave at the camera if you have questions. All right, guys. I'm going to assume that nobody else has questions. What? Check the chat. Check the chat. So... Would an optimized website help you sell your company? Yes, it is an asset. Um, so one thing that people worry about is their ability to generate leads. And that's why having a huge client list that you know the organic spending in it's 1.5 to $2 million. You know the referral revenue that's going to come off of it, six to $700,000 because you've done your newsletter, both mailed and emailed religiously. When you know that, hey, here, here's what I can show you 
for the last two or three years has come in as an or, as organic inbound leads from our website for the last two or three years. Here's how much money we get from this marketing medium. Here's how much money we get from our uh, realtor referral program. Here's the revenue that is generated by our recurring uh, commercial repaint clients. Every year we paint the dormitories at XYZ University or public school or these five places. And every August we do about $80,000 worth of this. So yeah, anything that, that, that tells a, um, that lends credibility and proof to a buyer that your business will be stable and easy to run helps. And if you ever need, like John in our office builds websites all day, every day, only for painters. He's good at it. He can build yours, get your newsletter, at least electronically out the door. That'd be a good start for some of you that never communicate with your clients or just treat them like a human ATM machine and try to hit them up with promotions all the time. Uh, it'd be a good start. So yeah, anything that, that you just put yourself again, Going back to the same old uh, adage, if you want to understand why John Smith buys, what John Smith buys, you have to see the world through John Smith's eyes. If you're the buyer, and, you know, if you take off your emotional blinders, and if you look at your company, uh, if you look at your company honestly and openly, what do you see? Is it good? Is it bad? And so um, you know, that's what you got to think about. Other questions? Anybody else? Anybody else brave enough? I know some of you have some, but you're probably probably too afraid to ask. But this is the busiest time of the uh, busiest time of the year. So sometimes people are too busy to even get on these things. I had a bunch of people say, "Send me the recording." You got any questions? Wave your hands. All right, guys, that's all we got. So I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope it's been helpful. Uh, there's I don't know anybody else in the world that talks about selling painting businesses. I think it is a very specialized piece of knowledge. I'm the only person that I've ever seen really get on this topic, but everybody's going to do it. So everybody's going to do it. It's like, you know, at some point you will stand between, you will stand in front of the judgment throne of God. Everybody's going to do it. Like the chances of getting out of this world alive, as Hank Williams Sr. said, are zero. <laughs> You're not getting out alive. Nobody's done it yet. And so you, of course, Maddie likes to ask the questions when I'm closing. That's the best time to ask them uh, and then to then to lose his screen. Uh, but you, you got to be able to do do those kinds of things. So I recommend uh, that if you're if, if you get your business ready to sell now, you'll have a lot more options. You'll have income options. You'll have you can leave whenever you want to. You can sell it whenever you want to. But if you wait on it, you drag your feet on it. Just think, you know, one day you decide I'm ready to sell this thing. Well, buddy, you still got three years left if you really want to maximize your income. So my suggestion is get started today so that when you want to sell it, you can sell it. You can put it on the market. You get mad in the morning. You're tired of it. You put it on the market at lunchtime. <laughs> and that's what that's where you want to be. You don't want to be, OK, I'm ready to leave. There's something going on in my life. It's not going well. We need to relocate. Oh, it's going to take me three years to get this thing ready. You don't want to be there. That's not a good position to be in. Uh, Maddie, do you have questions here at the end? Wait, wait until I've quit asking. You drive me crazy. All right. You got to unmute yourself. Can you do it? Yeah. There you go. Yep. Hello. All right. So uh, one question is, um, I was on a uh, uh, estimate during that time, and I was listening and weirdly talking with the homeowner. So I wouldn't sure really went advise great. that. Don't you hundred percent focused. <laughs> yeah. So I wouldn't advise that for you know other people, but uh, multitasking. But um, I I don't know if anybody else has this, but um, there's probably no perfect answer. But what is the ideal like number that you try to sell a a painting business for? Or not go under like five hundred thousand, six hundred fifty thousand. Uh, so to ask you answer your question, number one, the easiest thing for you since you're a member, go into the members only portal, right, and, and download that. Uh, I put in a, um, a valuation spreadsheet, and I bet Brian, I bet if you sat down with that thing in about ten minutes, you'd know what you could sell your painting business for today. 10 minutes. 
Now, if you don't want to get perfect, if you want to get it perfect, you're going to probably have to spend an hour. But if you want to just get a rough idea, like pretty darn accurate, but rough, not perfect, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, plug the numbers in there, you'll know. Uh, so go do that. Now, the answer is, you know, your business is worth, the business is worth what somebody will pay for it. That's what everything's worth. All right. And so you're, you know, typically two to three times net benefit to owner, which we talk about that cash flow to number owner. We want it to be at 30% yep. in our program. You do a million dollar business. You should be making 300,000. You do a half million dollar business. You should be making 150. And so that's, that's where we want to be. So you're going to see two to three times that somewhere between two and three times plus whatever your assets are. And that's a very simple valuation. I mean, people pay these, I've seen people pay these stupid firms four, five, six thousand dollars to value their business. I'm like, what the hell for? I mean, <laughs> it's like you don't need to pay somebody that amount of money to value your business. You can do it yourself if you know what they sell for. And so it's just insane. And for no other reason than that, somebody should y'all should sign up for this call so you can at least figure out what your business is worth about paying some consultant that probably hadn't ever sold a business before, doesn't know anything about it as as far as it relates to painting. So hopefully that helps, Brian. All right. Don't be doing that anymore on those sales calls. Now, I don't want any half-assed sales calls. When you're in front of the client, you're to be focused 100% on closing that deal. You can't be focused on closing the deal if you're listening to me in your ear about selling a painting business. <laughs> don't. I just got to give you a hard time over that. You got to focus. You got to sell. You got to sell. All well, right. I, I already had the job. It was, it was a uh, add-on um, oh, work. Yeah. See, but you could so. see if you were focused, though, you could have upsold that, yeah. that, that $5,000 add on could have turned into 7,200. You got to look around, man. <laughs> All right, buddy. So. I'll All talk right. to you later. That's Brian Maddie. He's one of our members, like Anthony, I'm very proud of that have changed their businesses dramatically. I mean, just I love looking at people when they get into our program and then look at look at what they look like when they get out. I don't, the only thing I dislike is when I sell, when I work myself out of a job, I very frequently do that. People say, you help me sell, sell my business. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, crap, I'm going to be out of a job with this one in about six to 12 months or however long they're going to take to sell it. So that's okay. A business coach tries to coach you and set you free. A consultant tries to milk you forever. That's how, that's the difference. That's why I'm a coach and not a consultant. Uh, all right, guys, I appreciate it. Uh, we're 401 at the top of the hour. I didn't take up any more of your time. Uh, than I promised I would. That's what I try to run a tight ship here at the Painters Academy. And so I appreciate you all very much. If I can ever assist you in any way, just email me, brandon at paintersacademy.com. Until next time, I'm Brandon signing off. Take care, guys.